Hey, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Boyce Moten. I have been a pilot and flight instructor for many years, and today's interview is going to involve aviation. I think it'll be of interest to anyone, but in particular, if you've ever thought about being a pilot, or if you're interested in aviation history, I want you to meet Jim Zirkel. Jim has been flying for over 50 years, accumulated thousands of hours, and we're gonna hear his story, how he got started, how he got into the military, and I think it's going to be an inspiration to everyone. Jim, uh, tell us about where you came from and how you got involved in aviation. Well, I came originally from Indiana. I allude to the fact that I happened to be in the right place at the right time and guided from above and so many of my aviation actions and career in it. And uh, I started in Indiana and I'll base my interest in aviation primarily as a result or even during World War II when we saw the airplane that uh, in World War I and had very little progress through the start of World War II, but World War II brought it so many changes in aviation that I was amazed even as a young boy. And uh, following the end of the war, uh, there were many aircraft for sale and uh, trainers and so forth and doing air shows. And my brother became one of those. He had served during World War II as an aviation cadet and he bought one of the trainers from World War II. And during this time, until I graduated from high school, I was so interested in flying that I started hitchhiking after church and go to the Smith Field in Fort Wayne where there was just cars lined up to see the aviation and the training that was going on primarily due to the GI Bill that the government started for everybody that served in World War II. And I started selling the tickets for airplane rides and got one of my own at the end of each day. Now, why did it cost in those days to get an airplane ride? Two dollars a person. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of people that uh, said, I'd go if I keep one foot on the ground. And I said, fine, I got a bucket of dirt, let's go. <laughs> but uh, that was the enthusiasm of people back in those days that were just lined up in cars. There were many planes flying due to the GI Bill. And upon high school, I moved to the airport. Now, now let's go back there because you're graduating class went on a trip and you didn't want to go on the trip, you wanted to go to the airport. That's correct. Uh, they went on a trip to Detroit, 1948, when I graduated and I didn't go. I moved into the hangar at the airport and lived in the hangar until I later got a room finally. But uh, I was putting airplanes in and out and selling gas and worked for the number one FBO, fixed base operator as we call them, and got a discount on my flying. Thoroughly enjoyed it. My brother, in the meantime, had become an instructor and soloed me out very early in my flight time. Now, yeah, without bragging, how many hours to solo? I had two hours and 15 minutes before <laughs> I soloed. The normal time was eight hours for our GI Bill program, and he wanted to set, and it made the newspapers. He set a record, and I didn't think anything about it. But that's what it did. Yet you had this desire, and you after church you'd hitchhike to the airport, and you would sell tickets for a couple of bucks a piece, and out of that you got a small percentage. But also the main thing, you got a free airplane ride. That's correct. And when you graduated, your heart was in aviation, and you were bold enough to just move into a hangar. And I, I want it didn't your aviation career did not happen by accident. No. No, I was guided, no doubt about it. And uh, the whole thing back in those days of Fort Wayne, Indiana, at Smithfield, really. And uh, I was just so happy to be around the airplanes, let alone uh, servicing them, taxiing them, and everybody would leave. I'd just get in them all, and maybe even take it around the field. It was dark enough. But uh, that was my desire. And you wanted to build flying time, and you were telling me earlier about a guy that chewed tobacco, couldn't fly in there, bought one, and you became his pilot. Yes, uh, Hale Manuel had worked on the Panama Canal, 
and he came out one day and took his first airplane ride in 2150 Nano, I'll never forget the number. And my boss took him a ride and kept flying him a little, but uh, he chewed tobacco. And uh, my boss couldn't hardly stand that <laughs> spicking and <laughs> spitting in the bucket. So one day he said, uh, I can't go, would you fly? And he said, Jimmy Zirkel could fly you, and I did, and thankfully uh, I became his pilot and flew and flew and flew and got my time, which you had to have so much time to get licenses. And I got my private license, and then hours built up, I got my commercial license, which is almost unheard of at my age, but I uh, got my commercial license in the meantime. And again, I want to emphasize for the benefit of anybody watching, is, ah, you had your parents bankroll you, but you didn't. No. Yeah, you were just kind of on a shoestring, and you believe that God was opening doors for you, but I mean, you were there, and uh, just like uh, the privilege of building hours, just flying somebody around, that would have cost you a lot of money if you'd had to pay for the airplane and the gas. Yeah, and uh, it was just guided, and especially, and I give so much thank it for Hale Manwater when I became his pilot, and uh, just build up my time to to get my licenses, mainly due to hail man water and other things that happened at the airport. Let's talk a little bit about your military service because I understand that when you took your civil service exam, there were 145. Leading up to that, one World II veteran, Jim Grossclose, kind of took me under his wing, called our congressman to see how he made his allotments for. Uh, candidates for the military academies. And it was a examination down at the post office in Fort Wayne. And so I went down and took the exam. There's 150 kids took that exam that day. And a few months or weeks later, really, I got a call from Washington from Ed Cruz's secretary asking me where I wanted to go. And I said, what's the option? I knew very little about military academy of those days, and I could have gone to the Naval Academy, the Coast Guard Academy, and West Point. And I knew so little, there was a crowd by that time. And uh, You're at the airport getting this important phone call from Washington. Yeah, in the Washington, and uh, in the office of the FBO. And they'd gather a bunch when they heard about it, and I, I just asked them, where did they, they said, oh, you want to go to West Point? So I told his secretary, I prefer to go to West Point. And she said, we'll send you the paperwork. And I did, went to Fort Sheridan, took the exams, uh, all the entrance exams, and passed everything. Uh, and that's how I got an appointment to go to the military academy, which, again, I was guided in my books, uh, and entered the academy and spent four years there and uh, learned quite vividly what it is like to live at that place. It's not like the normal college. But uh, upon graduation, they didn't have a Air Force of Caddy those days, but 25% of the class could go Air Force, and that's what I did. And uh, had a very fun time in flying T-6s, which were a very popular airplane after the war doing air shows, and I couldn't believe I got to fly them for free. And had a very uh, good, success in primary training and then went out for basic training and I got to fly the B-25. All right, now if you say a T, that means trainer. Yes. If it you say T B, and it, if you say B, that means bomber. bomber. Yes. It was a bomber through World War II and a very successful bomber. In fact, uh, when I was instructing the B-25 a few years later and our commander came in, and it was Colonel Travis Hoover as our wing commander, and I couldn't believe it. He was the number two pilot off the Hornet in the Doolittle raid. That bomb Tokyo uh, became quite famous and even a movie about it all, but it was the one thing that it made the Japanese back up because they didn't think they would ever be bombed, but the Doolittle Raiders did it with 16 B-25s. And Colonel Hoover, number two plane on that, came as our wing commander. And we were just in awe, and every one of us tried to take off in 500 feet, <laughs> which uh, was just remarkable. None of us could ever do it. We kept trying and trying and trying, but 
Colonel Hoover is one of my favorite people in the military. In fact, he was so favored I married his stepdaughter. Colonel Hoover and I had a lot of experiences together and uh, very thankful to know. And Colonel Hoover moved to Joplin when I had another B-25 here doing air shows all the time and took Colonel Hoover with me. That was the head of the air show anytime we could do that. But. I, I want to back up just a minute again, uh, Jim, for the benefit of people interested in aviation. It was the Air Force that really helped us win. We would not have won World War II Thanks. without the Air Force. Uh, and, and you were talking about this April 1942 Doolittle Raid mm -hmm. uh, from the USS Hornet. And uh, I'm told that the word kamikaze means divine wind. Yeah. And back hundreds of years ago, Japan had been saved from uh, an invading fleet by a hurricane, and they called it the kamikaze. Yeah. The and they felt like that nobody could attack Japan. And so the st there was, uh, it was a very strategic change in Japan's attitude as they had to leave some of their uh, airplanes behind to defend the island. And uh, I, I want to say that uh, I salute Jim because uh, we'll find out a little later on that he was a part of our strategic air command that helped keep the world safe from nuclear war for, well, for generations. Just to add to the B-25 B raid with Doolittle, when we bombed the country of Japan, Japan had to redo their thinking totally, and they brought a whole bunch of their ships, including aircraft carriers, back in the area of Midway, and we sunk them at Midway and changed the whole course of the war at Midway, but it was due to them being bombed by the B-25 yes. to do a little raid to change their attitude. And God bless Colonel Hoover oh, yes. and the other heroes of, of, that, of that flight. And you may take just a minute and uh, tell our viewers why the B-25 was called the Mitchell. Who promoted bombing of ships way back in the Navy and everybody thought he was way out of his head when he proposed this, but it proved so successful. In fact, he was up for court-martial, but uh, it was so successful later and in World War II that the B-25 was named after Billy Mitchell. Of course, uh, you know the story better than I, but I was quite impressed by the fact that after World War I, he claimed you could sink a battleship with an airplane and they took a German battleship called Ostfriedland. Mm -hmm. I think it went down to 29 minutes and, it, and uh, Billy Mitchell just said, we gotta prepare for war in time of peace and he was court-martialed, yes. died in 1936 yes. and uh, he said, they'll rue the day that you crucified me yes. because someday Japan could attack the Hawaiian Islands with airplanes, you'll drop soldiers out of airplanes, you will have cannons on airplanes and uh, our country has a way sometimes of not recognizing heroes when they're alive. So six years after his death, in honor of a man that had been unfairly treated. Well, t tell us a little bit about how you made the transition into jets. Well, when I was instructing in B-25s, in that time they were switching over to T-33, a jet trainer. And I was still instructing in B-25s was to be reassigned, I had enough B-25 hours and was jet qualified that I went to Wichita where they're training B-47 crews and I went as an aircraft commander and never flew co-pilot in any airplane really but most came to the B-47 flying co-pilot but thankfully I had enough towers and jet time and total time that I went through as an aircraft commander in the B-47. And well tell us a little bit I know that in 1962 as I recall we had the Cuban Yes. missile crisis and you helped play a role in preventing that war? Yes, I, uh, by this time I was off a crew and the head of operations at Lockburn Air Force Base which uh, I don't think I mentioned it but our B-47s carried electronic gear to jam the radar and we did that we didn't carry bombs our whole air division carried electronic jamming equipment in our bomb base but we went ahead of the and uh, our plan up till then was strictly against Russia. But when they put the missiles into Cuba, 
we got orders from SAC headquarters and Leo Weckert and I, in our mission planning, divined, designed plans for Cuba immediately and sent them to SAC headquarters. This was done and we were ready to go. I, thankfully, this was four days before President Kennedy came, came on TV stating what we were prepared to go to Cuba. We had everything set up four days before he was on TV to go. As someone has observed that no nation gets into war by being too militarily strong. Predators invariably pounce on that which is weak and vulnerable. But now on these trips, you actually flew uh, over the Atlantic Ocean in the B-47s? Yes. Yeah, we hit tankers out in the middle of it, but we could fly 14 hour missions and did so, but we had to refuel twice to do it. In going to England, we refueled once in the middle of the Atlantic and then we came home and refueled again. Now, refueling, as I understand, was one of your specialties. Why don't you tell our viewers how that happens? Well, I just uh, love the B-47. For me, uh, I won't say easy, but I learned fast. Refueling was probably the hardest thing to learn, and I was very successful at it. You had a small envelope you stayed in to stay on the boom of the tanker, and our first tankers were prop-driven C-97s. They were so slow, we'd have them descend so we wouldn't stall out. Then later they came out with the KC-135, which is a 707 airliner converted to KC-135 as tankers. And the B-47s with them was so slow, we'd say slow down <laughs> to the same cruise. But, uh, so the first time you had to speed up, and the second time yeah. they had an airplane had to to slow down. Yeah. I, now again, for those of us who are not familiar with military aircraft, tell us a little bit about the B-47. Well, it was designed, it took quite a while because it was a swept wing. The wings actually went backwards out to the wing tips and is a forerunner of all our modern airliners. But with the engines hanging below the wings, and on it, it was called a flex wing. Our wing tips could go up and down 17 feet in rough weather. But the B-47 was the forerunner of modern airliners. It would uh, cruise at what speeds? Well, 430 knots, which is Mach 7.4, 7400 of the speed of sound. And you could go, you had to refuel, but you could go how many hours? Oh. Our normal missions, uh, when I was there were 14 hours with two refuelings. But with the rockets we put on, 30 bottles of Jado and full of fuel. Uh, Jado is jet assisted takeoff. Correct, yeah, we hung those bottles on and fired them for 15 seconds and it just shoot us up like a missile. Now, Jim, uh, I was present when you were honored with uh, the one of the many honors that you've received of 50 years of flying without either an accident or a, a violation of federal aviation rules. It's called the Wright Brothers Award, and I was very thankful and the gentleman that nominated it for me and the letters I went in on my behalf. And it is from Federal Aviation Authority. The FAA is the only one that administers that. Their hands it out, and I'm very thankful to get that, yes. In World War I, a man by the name of John McRae wrote a very famous poem about Flanders Field. And the last stanza of that poem talks about, to you with failing hands we fling the torch. Be yours to lift it high if you break faith with us who die. We shall not rest though poppies blow in Flanders Field. And uh, out there watching you, Jim, is some young man or woman who's dreamed of a career in aviation, perhaps commercial aviation or flying in the military. So I just want to just ask you, if you would, to just give them a little fatherly advice from the thousands of hours and the many, many years of experience you've had in aviation. The big thing is take, if you have that interest, and seek it. And we have many, uh, like Mizzou Aviation over, now the second FBO, where you can get training. It's not $2 an hour anymore but uh, go after it. It's a very pleasant and rewarding career, 
and I would uh, greatly encourage anybody with the desire, you can go to, through CAP, they have uh, members that get free airplane rides. You got that desire, just don't hold back. And I'm sure like me, you'll be guided and uh, it'll be a reward you can enjoy. Mm -hmm.